the line that I wrote was, ooh, can we get that? But the way he said it was, ooh, oh, can we get that? <laughs> Hello, I'm Jacqueline Coley, and welcome to Scene on the Screen, brought to you by Make It Universal and Rotten Tomatoes, where we talk movies with some of the people behind the scenes at NBC Universal. When entertainment works best, sometimes it opens a window into a world we've never imagined. Other times, it shows us a mirror image of our lives with a heightened sense of home. Today, we're going to dig into the question, what have you seen on the screen that has done that? My guest today is the writer and director of The Wild Robot, Chris Sanders. Chris, welcome to Seen on the Screen podcast. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. All right, very favorite question. It's always the first one. Tell me who you are and what you do at NBC Universal. I'm Chris Sanders. Uh, I am a writer director working at DreamWorks Animation. Yeah, and you are the director of the new, I would say now critically acclaimed animation, The Wild Robot, which is going to be in theaters September 27th. I just saw it at TIFF. It's such an incredible film. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd love for you to dive into it a bit because the for folks that don't know, the movie is based off of a book series that is wildly popular um, by Peter Brown and you are adapting it. How did the story come into your life? How did you, you know, sort of decide that you'd wanted to adapt it i got so lucky um uh, i was actually i was i had just finished another project and looking for whatever i was going to do next and uh I, I i came into dreamworks to see what they had in development and they quite literally laid out some properties on a table in front of me and amongst them was this book the wild robot and uh the most scant description of it um told me immediately that amongst the things that were there this is the one that was absolutely interesting to me. So um, so I, I took it home and immediately read it and then called back kind of desperate to do it um, because there were so many things about it that were just right for me. It mm -hmm. was it was the sensibilities and the way the characters worked and the themes and all these things. They were just the it was the kind of space that I think I operate in mm -hmm. like successfully and 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 such. But there were also many things I'd never done before. So it was it was um, it was very important to me that I tr uh, get connected to it. Um, so I called Margie back and um, and it all began from there. And just for the folks that don't know, Margie is... Margie Cohn. She's the president of Feature Animation at uh, DreamWorks. It's an arresting piece of work, this story about this robot who gets sort of abandoned in the middle of nowhere and ends up not only surviving, but finding a little bit of her humanity through the course of being an adoptive mother. Like, I, it just, I love the story of it, but... I imagine picking who your Roz was going to be was kind of a daunting process. <laughs> um, and so I'm l proud that you guys were able to get Lupita Nyong'o because obviously she's the perfect choice. But how did you know that she'd be perfect for Roz? Um, I have full credit to Christy Soper, our casting director. It is the art of what she does. Uh, I can't do it. I, I'm no good at that. But she is. And um, she was uh, she was the one that suggested Lupita. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, you know, I know her just like anybody else would. I've, I've seen her films and I know she's an amazing actor. And the next step was to to talk with her. And uh, and she she asked a lot of questions. We had a very long talk and she just needed to understand, like, was this going to be a partnership? Would, would we be collaborating? And so she was very, very careful about about like understanding everything about the project that she could before she agreed to do it. Mm. Yeah. And the other thing I think when folks, uh, if they haven't seen the trailer, haven't seen it, the visual language of it, the fact that it's like the painting almost aspect of it. I mean, there's certain scenes, I think, especially in like the migration sequence where it literally feels like every frame could be a painting. Um, talk about how you discovered that was going to be the visual language of this one, because the book is very descriptive, but you really could have taken this anywhere with the island. Absolutely. Um, as I read the book, the imagery that was coming to my mind, um, I would liken to the, the, the thing that made me want to go into animation as a little kid, which was Bambi. Um, it was very rich and it was very sophisticated. And it was very important to me that we we had a rather sophisticated look because I didn't want to, I wanted, the way I would say it is I wanted people to see it in the right way, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, I didn't want it to come off too young. It, it's, an, it's, it's a story for everyone, but um, I just thought it's it deserves that level of visual um of visual richness i guess and so you are absolutely right it it literally is a moving painting um with puss in boots the last wish and with bad guys dreamworks had made these amazing advances in getting away from 
I would say, the gravitational pull that held us to a CG look mm -hmm. that we had to do because that's where the technology was. It's a hyper-realistic look where you, like, when you get close to an animal, you see every little piece of fur and such. Um, but they were doing a more illustrated style. And so um, we were doing these uh, initial uh, color sketches. There are, there are little, little tiny quick paintings that, um, that we do so that we can just start to explore where we will go visually with the film. And Ramon Zeebeck, our, our, um, our production designer, I asked him, well, could our finished film look like these? Mm -hmm. Can we go no further than these exploratory sketches? And he said, let's go for it. So um, it sounds like we'd be like, you know, holding back, but actually this, this means we would have to go well beyond where the visual style had even gone. So they began working on that in parallel with the rest of us, and I work with the story and the narrative. So what they eventually created was something where they could literally paint in dimension. Meaning, if I picked up a paintbrush and just started painting in the air in front of myself, and I turned that and began and continued the painting until it became a complete thing. So that's literally what's going on inside of this of this film. And the look that it produces, I like to say, has the analog warmth that you can only get from a hand painted thing. Mm. Um, and so. This is an interesting thing for me because I began animation in 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 the olden days when we were drawing and painting everything, and um, and there was there was this analog warmth that you can only get from that kind of thing, and when CG came along, we got so many things, not the least of which was the ability to move a camera in space, and the emotional impact that you get from that cannot be understated, but we also lost touch with things, and we had to, so those handed hand painted things were left behind. And now we were building geometry and wrapping it in textures. And not to get too boring with it here, but like, say like trees, if we have a forest full of trees, we would build them and cover them with a texture and then try to make enough variances in them that when you were very clever about the way you place them together, they gave the impression of a forest. Yeah. But now we're just painting. And what that means is with, with loose brush strokes, we were doing what happens if you go to a gallery and say you're standing in front of a Monet, get really close to it, and it just becomes nonsensical blobs of color. And yeah. when you back up, it all pulls together into a garden. Um, and that's what's going on. So now these broad brush strokes were creating these environments that actually are relatively low detail. And the thing that I did not expect is that the overall effect, in a way, has more reality to it than anything I've ever seen before. Now, the characters had to have the very same textures, or they wouldn't. They wouldn't. Matt. Right. They wouldn't harmonize. So um, they worked very hard to do the very same thing with the characters. They do have geometry underneath them, but they are all brush strokes on the surface. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of blow dried look that we used to have on all our creatures, that's gone. Real animals have matted fur. And again, that's what happened. So if Fink the fox gets really close to the, the, the lens, you don't see those individual bits of fur. You see these brush strokes. Um, and again, the interesting thing is, it kind of feels and looks, I would say, I would argue more real. Um, it's like a throwback too. It like really is. It's like it's coming full circle. I'm glad you said that because that, that's exactly what I've been saying is that uh, it, it's like this journey that I was on that we departed from the analog paintings and we, we went all the way away and picked up all these wonderful tools with CG the cameras and such. And now we've rejoined that. We've closed the circle. Wow. I mean, this is not your first rodeo. I mean, three Oscar nominations so far. And this, I think, is going to be one that we're going to be talking about for a while. But I think it is one where your work as an animator in particular has been really explanative because I don't know if every single even animation director could describe it to that detail of what you were saying, like not just analyzing your film, but how it fits in the history of the animation that we've done. And I guess that's a part of everything that you do with this film. Like I was so surprised to hear that you actually draw a lot of the storyboards yourself and like sort of map all of that out. Um, talk about how that's a part of what you end up doing in your sort of like directing process. Because again, I know a lot of uh, animation directors, they're, they're talented artists in their own right, but I don't know if they have that same sort of like, you know, the grind of, of doing it that way. It's where I came from. Um, when I first started working in feature animation, I worked with Ed Gombert and Brenda Chapman and, um, and, and amazing, amazing, I would say some of the, the greatest story artists 
there have ever been. And um, I was just so fortunate to learn that craft with them. Um, and, and in a story room, we're all working on the same movie, but we can have different opinions and different you know, viewpoints on things. And everybody's opinion is of equal weight. Um, so I, I learned the art of arguing points and defending ideas. Um, and it's sometimes it's almost like being a lawyer. Like if you feel very strongly about something, but you can't really defend it, then it has to go away, right? Yeah. And so the best ideas win. And eventually there's sort of this, this cumulative, um, this cumulative effect that happens um, when that when that goes on. So if I'm working on a story issue, sometimes the best thing for me is just to sit down with a with a story pad, not at a st at, I don't do so well at the uh, at the electronic. Um, <laughs> we I just, get it. You're analog. We get yes, it. Yes, <laughs> I'm more analog. Um, but um, a lot of people wonder, for example, what ha what happens in editorial in an in an animated realm? Um, and you know, some people think, and I used to think, is the editor simply assembling the drawings? And they are, but a lot more than that happens. I would say that's like the hub of our story wheel. Mm. And so sometimes on The Wild Robot in particular, I would spend an entire afternoon with Mary Blee, our editor, and I would just draw. And we would talk mm -hmm. about a moment in the story. And when I can draw, I'm really there. And you start to see the moment and, and I work through things in a different way. Um, and I can solve problems. Uh, and so I did generate quite a few drawings uh, in the making of this film. Yeah, and then I know, uh, for example, they're actually packaging those storyboards with another book. And we actually do have the book right here that is The Art of the Wild Robot. And it's written by Jerry Schmidt. It's got a foreword by Lupita Nyong'o. And then obviously, you know, you did one of the introductions and Peter did the preface. There's a lot of people at the beginning of this book. I love this. Um, and then the afterword by Jeff Herman. I love this. Let's take a look. I'm thrilled that the book is here. Um, uh, Jerry just showed me um, this this book and, and um, there's even a a deluxe edition and the deluxe edition includes and i'm very 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 flattered um really and truly uh, there's a there's a, a a book within the the case so the art book is there but then there's a, a another book that has a collection of um some of my story my story drawings and um and uh and some of the script uh is packaged together oh, i do love that all right lovely well we'll put this back down and it will join our stack of acclaim with oppenheimer puss in boots and now the wild robot uh, before we get into um, some of the things that you've seen on the screen and some more details, one of the big themes from this one is about family and finding your own family. And I will say it's delicately woven throughout the story. Uh, there's high points, low points, and everything in between. But I'd love for you to talk about how you sort of wanted to make sure that message was felt throughout the story and how you sort of added that into all of these characters. Because... It's a very interesting thing that I think the audience is going to leave with. It's going to be emotional, I think, for a lot of people. It was emotional to make it in the in the very best sense of it. Um, it's I, I fall credit to Peter Brown. You know, he he wove all of that into into the the book and the translation from the page to screen. That was I think job one was to to preserve that that core story. Um, there were things we had to do. There were some characters I trimmed back. I added a few plot points to 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 make things a little more com complex here and there. But um, the idea of I, I I just I'm really attracted to the idea of like families that fall together through happenstance. Mm. Nothing is perfect, um, and so that's definitely within the story. Um, our very first conversation with Peter Brown when we began the project, you know, I didn't even know what to ask him. I had no real questions. I just wanted to talk to him, and he laid something on us that changed everything. Mm. In that very first conversation, he said the thing that was on his mind as a guiding principle while he wrote it was the idea that kindness can be a survival skill. Mm. And that was guiding uh, Roz through the story as he wrote it. And I immediately wrote that down and thought, that's something I need to memorialize in the script and get it up onto the screen. Um, so it's, it's one of the load-bearing ideas in the whole story. And it's what Roz is all about. Yeah. She has she's running a program and and but at the core of it, you know, it's a very she's very kind. Um, and that begins to change everything on the island. Before we move on, I want to ask you this, since we're talking a little bit about family, what about your family? Like, I feel like you have one of those jobs that sounds so cool, but it's also probably one of those jobs that's difficult for a lot of people to understand when you say 
oh, this is what I want to do. Was your family always as supportive of you on this animation journey? And like, what what have they what did they say when they saw Lilo and Stitch? Basically, <laughs> uh, they were really happy with it. You know, uh, I I have when I was a kid in Colorado, I uh, everybody was very supportive of of me drawing and writing nonsense stories and things like that. So and. Uh, at one point, you know, I, I thought animation is something I really wanted to do. And my grandfather like built me a little light table and I didn't know what to do with it. It was just <laughs> something we saw like in the back of a book, like, and so I, I never really understood it, but it, it was, it was, it was always encouraged. Yeah. I love that. All right. So now this is the fun bit. No pressure. It's a little bit of a quiz, but I have faith in you that you're going to have an amazing time with it. So we're going to go into our popcorn bucket and I'm going to give you a quote. And this is hopefully going to be something that you've seen on the screen and you will recognize it. Okay. I hope you recognize this. (laughs) Ohana means family. Family means no one gets left behind. Oh, good. I know this one. (laughs) That would be. I do know this one. This is from Lilo and Stitch. I wrote that line. That is like every animated film, I think, has a a fan base to, you know, any degree. The fan base of Lilo and Stitch is deep. It is just it's 20, almost 22 years since it came out. And it's still I feel like people are talking about it all the time, like like that whole story. Yeah. You know, it's I think it's more present than it was in the beginning. Uh, I see it everywhere, and I, I can't tell you how many times I'm, I am stitch adjacent. Somebody is wearing stitch um, or carrying a stitch, uh, or stitch luggage is rolling past me, and it's really, really, it's one, it's wonderful when that happens. Over the past twenty two years, do you have a standout moment that you've experienced uh, with the film since its release that you know you always sort of speak fondly, whether it be through the film initially coming out or maybe something that happened like years later? Oh God, you know, there's a, it sounds strange, but like my the, I got really emotional when I was a kid and we came out to Disneyland for the first time. I um, I never thought I'd ever see Disneyland in person. It was amazing. Actually, when I saw it, I I threw up because I was so excited <laughs> um, <laughs> when I saw it. But um, there was a there was a Lilo parking area, and I stood beneath the sign and I was like, I made it. I, yeah. I'm somebody. This is this is like this is such a, a compliment um, that I I have a parking area that has been designated by one of my characters. I mean, literally, you see them walking around all the way through um, Disney Town Square. All right. Next quote, if it's not Baroque, don't fix it. It's not Baroque. That's Beauty and the Beast, I think? Definitely. All right. That was such a seminal moment for animation in general, just what that movie was able to to achieve um what was that like for you where were you when when that one came out i was that was that was me learning how to storyboard and how to work in a story crew so um that a lot of things i do are 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 compared with that in uh schedule wise by the way is like it's about four years from Mm -hmm. start to finish and i've always quoted that as being like that's the ideal amount of time to to make one of these feature films you don't want too much time you don't want too little and beauty and the beast i thought was really the perfect tempo and pace to to make one of these films that was also one of the films i think all um animated films and definitely all disney at that time animated films uh are really big about the music you know it was a huge part of it but that was also something that is in the dna of wild robot too i mean you have chris bowers on the score with this you have some incredible artists doing original songs for it how early do you start those music conversations you know, as early as possible, um, I've I've learned a lot. Uh, I put a premium on music um, for a lot of reasons, but um, uh, on Beauty and the Beast, I was actually able to work directly with Howard Ashman. Uh, we all got together with him early on because he was just trying to sort out what songs would go where and and such. And um, at the we went to Fishkill, uh, New York, and we we just like stayed there for a few days, worked directly with them. And at the end of our first day, I asked him a question. I said, I, I have a dumb question. Where do you know to put the songs? How do you know where to put them? And he said, "That's easy. You put them at the story turns." And I that was it wasn't simple to me. I, I thought that was amazing. And but so many things came clear with that. Um, on Lilo and Stitch, um, Alan Silvestri taught me something really important. The moment where Stitch turns from bad to good, because at the at the base of it, it's about a, a villain that becomes a hero, mm. and um, and there's this moment where he turns, and uh, and Alan looked at our boards and he looked at the story reel and he said, I I, I get everything I'm I'm I, I figure out you know I, I'm following everything. There's one thing I don't see. 
I don't see where Stitch shifts. And both Dean Deblois and I, um, we were like, uh, mm, uh, oh yeah, uh, well, uh, it sort of happens here, literally between these two drawings that it wasn't there. And um, we both pretty much said, we didn't know how to say it, so we left it off screen. And he said, and Alan said, put it on screen and I'll say it. Oh. And that was like a, a giant light bulb lit up a, the dawn of realization broke across my brow and I realized <laughs> oh my gosh it's a story music can be a storytelling element yeah. so it was a huge thing that I never forgot and it's one of the reasons I put such a premium on music and from from then on I built what I would term houses for music within the story places where the characters stop talking and music takes over and the biggest best first time that that happened um, was on How to Train Your Dragon. The oh. sequence where Hiccup and Toothless are alone in the cove and they're gonna, they're gonna have to work something out. And it's a big sequence, it's, like, it's five plus minutes. And, um, and uh, John Powell knew from the very beginning that we, we told him, this is all yours this is you, <laughs> you're gonna do this. Um, and he waited and waited actually, and he told us later that that was the last piece of music he actually composed because wow. he was relatively intimidated by how much pressure was on that. And of course, what he did was incredible, Brilliant, amazing. Yeah. Um, and Chris Bowers with The Wild Robot, again, knew the places that he was gonna be doing the heavy lifting. And um, in a 90 some odd minute mu movie, we have 80 minutes of music, so he is the the biggest voice in the film, really. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and he he came on as early as possible and began sketching themes. Wow. Um, so he's been with us for quite a while. Real quick, what's your favorite sequence where you gave Chris the heavy lifting that he then did that lifting? The migration sequence. Yeah. Um, it's 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 the big uh, the midpoint of the film and. Um, he was doing um, obviously amazing stuff, um, but something happened in there because um, I was so dreadfully afraid that just a quirk in the storyboards would cause him to have to like maneuver musically around something that there, there came a point where I, I realized I don't want him to have to worry about that. And I said, just at this point, just turn off the visuals and just write the music, just listen to it, write the music, do what you need to do. I just wanted to make sure that every single theme had the room and time to fully expand and be what it needed to be. I didn't want to, I didn't want to ever risk interrupting it. Yeah. And I said, you do the music and then we're going to come in and we will, we will customize it to that. I'll change the boards. I'll change the timing. We'll, we'll follow your lead on that. So he truly at one point just, he took the lead and we, you know, we fell in behind him wow. and just followed it. And the result was incredible. All right. You did great. See, as I suspected. I was super scared. I mean, all animated films, they were batting for the home team. Let's let's <laughs> let's be real. Um, so we're going to dive into our next popcorn bucket. And this one is actually going to be true or false. Oh. In The Wild Robot, the animation team innovated the animal's eyes based on real ones found in nature, departing from the human-like eyes commonly seen in CGI characters. True or false? A giant true, because that was all me. Oh. I, 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 had, I had sort of an axe to grind about, about human eyes ending up in, in everything from fish to, to, to people to dragons. And they're beautiful. I get why they do that, because they're gorgeous. You know, they're, they're, they're like jewels, and they, mm -hmm. they gleam, and they're, and, but, um, but it... It, it sometimes it takes me out of things, mm. and uh, and everything else we had been working towards was to 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 get real animals up on screen, and so immediately I said we've got to re-engineer and rethink their eyes so that the eyes don't break the spell that we're creating. That's incredible, and I will say it's interesting because the cast of people that you had voicing these animals are so lifelike. I feel that you can add sort of depth to it. I mean, what Lupita was doing with Roz, she feels so real and like human-like, and it's same thing with Pedro and Catherine. Talk about the voice cast a bit because it is it is very stacked, and I know for a while the voice cast was just you. So how did you cast your stand-ins, basically? <laughs> um, 
uh, Christy Soper, uh, you know, she she uh, she brought the cast together, and we got really really lucky that everybody that we we went out to as our very first and, and best choice, they all said yes. Um, and you know, I do my best to write everything you know as good as I can. But uh, as the moment an actor says says yes and, and joins the project, even before we go into recording, I immediately go back and do my very best to try to start to customize it to what I would think that their voice would be and mm-hmm. and their their you know their character. Um, and in the case of Roz, it was a, it was an immense job because um, I had already given Roz a big limitation. In Peter Brown's illustrations, he always indicates uh, Roz ha- has a mouth, and it's just a really simple little line. But I was insistent that Roz have no mouth. I wanted the only articulation on her face to be her eyes. Mm. Um, I've always felt that in the absence of articulation on that kind of a character, our audience will project their own emotions onto it, um, and and that's going to work the very very best. So all of Roz's emotions and acting was going to come through Lupita's performance and and the pantomimed movement by the animators, um, and and this is where the choice of Lupita was like the the best thing in the world because she took this very very seriously, and uh, our first conversations were all about like how does Roz think, how does she work. Our very first recording session was here in in New York, and um, we didn't even go to the mic for well over an hour. We just sat and talked, and and it was absolutely fascinating to to see how she approached this whole thing. In a sense, taking Roz all apart because she needed to understand the utility of the character. Like, how does Roz think? How does she see things? Um, and how is she going to process things? So um, we collaborated um, uh, every step of the way. I never finished a recording session without leaving with notes uh, mm. and things to be done. And then I would sit down and I would rework every scene. And next time we got together, we would re-record. Um, so that was all about um, uh, Roz's thinking patterns and her speech and the things she would say. On top of that, we wanted Roz to change throughout the th- throughout the story. We wanted her voice to to morph and and to and to and to become more human, if you will. So um, that was another part of this whole thing. And you will watch the film, and you're gonna you're gonna hear Roz change. There's nothing we're doing electronically. That is 100 percent wow. Lupita's performance. And uh, in, I, I I think it's safe to say she was really stressing her voice, especially in the opening. I would say uh, the best way to describe it, we have a phase one, a phase two, and a phase three of Roz's voice. Phase one, when she first arrives on the island and she's activated, um, uh, we coined the fr- like we coined the phrase um, "engineered uh, optimism." <laughs> so she she pushes her voice into this higher register, and um, and she's hello, and she's and so she she's got this sort of can do vibe with everything, and then later on she begins to to change. She starts to use contractions, and by the midpoint of the film, it's it's Lupita doing Lupita a more relaxed voice, and um, and as we record, we never do things all the time in in sequence yeah. uh, so we, we bounce around there are reasons for this we bounce around so as we would record dialogue we would just note this is a phase one or a phase three or a phase two voice um, so she'd put herself into that place for that for that particular line oh, I, I'm sorry I'm just thinking about how technical that is and again voice acting is a, just a different muscle and a different level I just have to ask this one last one though is there one particular line read that you got from one of the actors that completely surprised you um, again because most of the time these folks are outside of Lupita going to be coming in later into the process yeah. what was that one it's a perfect question um uh, uh Peter Pascal um I don't think he'd ever done anything quite like this before we were exploring the, the character of Fink together and Fink the Fox of course he's manipulative and he's 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 very very smart um and there there was a, a moment in the film it is not there anymore it was edited out for good reason but uh, you know, on the journey of making the film there was a scene and Roz has the equivalent of a little tablet that she can produce and um it was a little bit where she had a catalog of accessories that you could order and think was you know greatly interested in, he was very interested in supercharging his robot because he liked having a robot so that he could get things done that he don't, you know he, she protected him and, and acquired food and things he was manipulating her so he saw something on the tablet that he wanted and the line that i wrote was "Ooh, can we get that 
but the but the way he said it was, ooh, oh, can we get that? <laughs> and that was it. I was like, that's faint. He, he was like a little kid yeah. in a grocery store asking his mom, you yeah. know, for something. And um, it was so him. It was it, it it's so him. Yeah. Um, and uh, and that for me was like the touchstone that I would always go to when I was thinking about like lines for Fink. Peter told me later that the character Fink as in the wild robot is more him wow. than most things that he actually does. Oh, I like that. I, I, you know what? That's interesting and informative. Chris, sir, thank you so much for talking about your craft and your filmmaking and your history with DreamWorks and NBC Universal. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much. 